Thank you for the kind introduction, Sven. Thank you, Jack. This is joint work with Eric Holman, who is a postdoc on our RTG grant, and is really an uh, undergraduate student, Jonathan Ryan, who put us onto this problem. However, first things first, happy birthday, Jack. And uh, I think it was in 1984, I just graduated, didn't know many people. And I think it was the occasion of the Argonne meeting that Jack uh, offered I stay at his place with him and Sue instead of going to a hotel. And I was really surprised and I really appreciated that, you know, Jack and Sue would take in a total stranger and make me feel really welcome. Yeah, and then the other thing I'd like to emphasize is that, of course, everybody is in awe of Jack's academic accomplishments, but perhaps even more of his um, uh, stellar uh, uh, mileage, uh, uh, um, his, his, his stellar status, mileage status for the airlines, as was uh, extensively documented by Ian yesterday. That really, that draws uh, admiration, Jack. So uh, we are in the business of summation, um, just uh, n real numbers in floating point arithmetic. And it is all the rage these days to do mixed precision. And we are going to be old fashioned and just going to do operate in one and only one precision without recourse to other precisions or better hardware like uh, wider accumulators. And I'm going to talk about two methods and that is with the vision of doing things in lower precision and being accurate there. One is shifted summation and one is Cahan's compensated summation. So let me just set the stage here with a with traditional method. Um, of course, we'd be all lost without Nick's book. Um, this is just sequential summation. So we start with one number, we add um, other numbers. And in floating point arithmetic, every time we do a summation, we incur a round of error. Now, every summation involves all the previous quantities. And so, of course, it's x1 and x2 that get subjected to the most round off since we do n n uh, additions. We have n minus 1 round offs. And then we get this bound here partly the, the end coming from uh, X1 and X2 being subjected to basically uh, uh, N roundoffs. And we see a condition number here, and that says that if all the summons have the same sign, the problem is well conditioned. If they don't have the same sign, we may have cancellation in the denominator here. Okay, so we could have tighter error bounds and there has been uh, quite a bit of effort lately. So Eric has uh, just an explicit expression for the error in sequential summation and um, nothing big, but uh, I'll, come to it, I'll come back to it later. That's why I'm putting it up. Then there are probabilistic bounds. So Nick has been involved in that where one treats the round offs as random variables, bounded, zero mean, and they can be independent or mean independent. And then with high probability, one can show that the error is proportional to a square root of n times the machine precision rather than n times the machine precision. And now we are wondering how can we come up with more accurate algorithms? So he has shifted summation, which is really um, motivated by what people do in computer architecture and formal methods for program verification, where they try to automatically verify the correctness of a program. So they assume that the inputs are drawn from some distribution. Then they go compute statistics for the accumulated errors and then determine the probability that the accumulated error is in a certain interval. Now that is really awkward, unwieldy and not very feasible. So then prompted by this, Nick and his collaborators looked at probabilistic bounds, probabilistic bounds for random data. And the idea here is that sequ sequential summation is accurate if all the summons are tightly clustered. So here, um, is the uh, a bound that Eric improved upon what Nick and Theo had done. So assume the round offs are independent zero mean random variables, of course, bounded by the machine uh, unit uh, round off. And let's assume, let's assume our um, summons are clustered around a mean and have a variance. This is a variance in apostrophes. This is just the distance from the mean of all the summons that's bounded by sigma. Then one can show with high probability that the forward error is bounded above by this expression. Here we have the mean. If the mean is small or close to zero, then this thing is small. Here we have the variance, the, the difference from the mean. Well, if the, the summons are tightly clustered, then this thing is zero. So the qualitative um, con conclusion here is that if, if you have random data that are tightly clustered around zero, 
your error should be much smaller. So then Nick and Theo went on to apply this to non-random data. So here's an example. Assume all our summons are 10,000 plus a number that's less than or equal to one. So if we do sequential summation and look at the first order error bound, well, everybody is in magnitude at most 10 to the four plus one. However, instead, the idea that uh, Nick and, and Theo had is let's center the data. So basically, this, what this does is it removes the most significant bits so that the YK retain the tail bits or the least significant bits. Then we compute the sum from the least significant bits and then at the end, while you know, all the uh, 10 to the fourth that we had subtracted, we have to add back. But the, 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 the idea here is to do that for non-random data is a little like compensated summation. The centered sums capture the tail bits, the least significant bits of the summons, and therefore we incur a smaller error. So here's a shifted sequential summation algorithm that uh, Nick and Theo have in their paper. And we have two types of round of errors here. We have the round of errors, the red ones, we incur from centering. And we have the blue ones that we incur, uh, yeah, and the blue ones that we just incur from summing up. And then we can show an explicit expression for the errors that comes in two neat parts. The first one is basically the error that we would get from summing up. And the second part is the error that we incur due to centering. Now, if we could do the centering exactly accurately, then this thing would go, go away and we'd get just the expression that we got for sequential summation. Okay, so this, this is all well and fine, but we need bounds. So this previous expression gives an error bound that is phrased just in terms of the shifted quantities, in terms of the exact shifted quantity. So I guess it's called a priori bound. And then if we, uh, then we can also uh, provide a probabilistic bound. So again, we assume our, all our round of errors are conveniently independent, zero mean random variables. Then we have a forward error that's bounded in terms of a maximum. That is basically the maximum intermediate partial sum times beta. And beta is, I can't use my, my pen here because I'm running out of uh, real estate. Beta is basically square root of n times unit round off. And this is a small factor. So, and uh, this is the, the, the maximal shifted sum is basically what Nick says, section 4.2 in his book. I always remember his book of section four, everything, that to minimize that the, the partial sums is the way to make a summation more accurate. So let's look at some uh, numerical toy experiments. So we have um, 10 to the 600,000 summons. We use as the shift um, the largest plus the smallest over two. So it's an approximation to the empirical mean. Um, the working precision here is 64 bits in Julia and the exact computation is 256 bits. We plot the relative errors. And then the probabilistic bound, it's not quite the bound. I just took this factor. And then we're going to look at two different types of summons the tightly centered summons around uh, 10,000, 10, and then uh, summons that are normal um, zero one. So in, uh, normal standard Gaussians with the uh, mean zero and variance one. So what we have here, uh, we have the problem size on the horizontal axis. We have between 10 to the 19 to 10 to the minus 13 on the vertical axis. Blue is shifted summation. Uh, green is plane summation. And this is our bound. So when the summons are tightly clustered, that shows that shifted summation can be more accurate by a, um, by a factor of 10 or 100 than plane summation. And our bound is qualitatively good and within a factor of 100. However, if you take summons that are tightly clustered at zero, and this is not necessarily well conditioned problem because we can incur cancellation. So then you see here's 10 to the minus 17, 10 to the minus 10. And you see that plane summation actually is more accurate than the shifted summation. And here's our bound, our probabilistic bound. So again, the bound is within a factor of 10 or 100, but this time shifted summation actually is, does damage to the accuracy. 
So our summary here is that the arrow bounds we have depend only on the shifted exact quantities. They hold to all orders, their exact bounds. And the error is proportional to square root of the number of summons rather than number of summons. And shifting improves the accuracy if the shift decreases the magnitude of the partial sums, exactly the advice that Nick gave in his book. So we have extension to general summation algorithms where we treat the round offs either as mean independent or independent random variables and the probabilistic bounds depend on the square root of the height of the computational tree. Again, the bounds are valid to all orders. So the warning is that shifting can, shifting can worsen accuracy, especially if one has data that are naturally, naturally centered. Okay, so let's go on to Kahan's method now. So this is compensated sequential summation. So Kahan uh, had a one page paper in 73, and here is his method. Okay, so what happens is we add things. These are the partial sums. We, these are our summons. After we've um, added the next summoned, we, we cover the arrow and the summation. So this is the partial sum. We subtract this and this. So this uh, is supposed to recover the arrow in the least significant bits. Then we take this, infuse it into the next summoned, and hope that thereby we decrease the error in the whole sum. Okay, so let's just compare this with centered summation. So again, we have tightly clustered summons at 10,000, um, and we add a little bit with a uniform uh, zero random uh, variable. And then you see here is 10 to the minus 19, 10 to the minus 13. We are plotting relative errors against the number of summons. Red is um, compensated summation blue is uh, centering and green is plain summation. So you see that compensated summation is at least as accurate as centered summation. Uh, if we have uh, uh, not a, a problem that's not necessarily well, well conditioned where shifting can actually do damage, we still see that compensated summation gives us machine precision accuracy. Okay. So now we went on. So now you can say, oh, but we, we know we know bound for, for compensated summa summation. Well, we wanted to just explore that a little further. So in compensated summation, you're doing uh, three more additions. So it's going to be more expensive. But uh, we have round of errors for each additional addition that we do. And the red ones here are associated with the, with the correction. Then the, uh, the traditional forward error bound is, says that the, the error is only into first order two times u, independent of the number of summons we, uh, we, order, uh, we, we add up, plus n u square. Okay, um, off we go and we uh, derive a couple of explicit expressions for compensated summation. We get the expression for the forward error and for the correction. And we do a little uh, vector recurrence where this, these are the, this is the error and the correction when we uh, form the partial, the kth partial sum. It's related to the previous partial sum by a matrix PK that has only the round of errors of the kth addition in it, and then some sort of stationary terms. So with that, we can get an explicit expression that depends only on exact quantities, not computed quantities. Okay, we have a second expression just showing off. This is not so great because it involves computed quantities. And furthermore, we have a third expression. And this now makes it easy to read off the local, the first order errors. So this is the error in the computed sum minus the true sum. It's um, equal to the error we get in the last summation. A lot of uh, second order stuff plus this here. This is, you can see first order errors here. You can read off the first order errors, this, and then these guys. So with this, we can get a bound. So uh, or ex uh, an expression to, 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 to second order. So the error then is the, the, the round of error we get in the final summation, the round of errors we get in the correction steps. So we can actually identify particular round of errors and everybody else. So here you can count errors, one, two, three. So our bound then is three u times uh, the usual sum. And that is not incon it's inconsistent with previous bounds, which say two u. And that's why we would derive three 
uh, explicit expressions actually independently. Eric derived something, I derived something, and independently we came to the same result. And I think it's because Goldberg in his analysis looks only at X1. And X1 is afflicted by one less round of error than all the other Xs. So I think that may be the reason. So we can also get a second error bound, a second order error bound. Uh, you don't need to look at this, but uh, when you actually look at the deterministic bound, you have three times machine um, uh, unit round off and then four N times uh, second order unit round off. So, and then we have a probabilistic bound um, where uh, with high probability we get, um, here is the first order error, and here we have the two norm of X, not the sum of absolute values. So this is a little better here. And then here you have a square root over N. So again, that, that confirms the error to, to second order now is proportional to square root of N. So let's do some experiments. So here now I'm going to do things in, um, in half precision. So, uh, float 16 in Julia, so there our unit or uh, unit round of is 10 to the minus four. We are going to do the exact precisions in, in double precision. We're going to plot the relative errors versus the number of summons and then our probabilistic bounds. And this factor we occur here, we are setting the um, failure probability equal to 10 to the minus two. And then this extraneous factor here comes out to 3.26. Again, we are looking at our two different types of summons, well-conditioned ones and not necessarily well-conditioned ones. So here's the well-conditioned problem where all the summons have the same sign. Here's 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus three. So this is what we are entitled to in half precision. So uh, we are getting machine precision with compensated summation in half precision. This is our bound, that's pretty good. And this is ordinary summation. So here we are adding only 60,000 numbers because um, all the numbers can be in magnitude, well, they're, they're non-negative, right? And the largest number in, in, in binary 16 is 65,504. So that's as high as we can go because we don't get cancellation. However, if we allow cancellation, we can add up to, uh, to 10 to the five numbers here. And then you see again, here's 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus four. Again, compensated summation almost gives us um, unit round off in, in, half, in half precision. Here's our bound, which is pretty good within a factor of 10. And then here is ordinary summation. Okay, um, huh, I'm making up for time. Okay, so what we did here is we have, uh, we looked at the forward arrow in the summation of n real numbers. Uh, we did not uh, take any recourse to higher precision or better arithmetic. We looked at two methods, um, shifted sequential summation, so there we have explicit expressions and probabilistic bounds valid to all orders. So that is good for when one does things in lower precisions. Um, we uh, have an extension to general summation algorithms in this paper here, down here. Um, centering can be more accurate if it does decrease the magnitude of the partial sums, but it can also hurt the accuracy. And I've played a little bit around with mixed precision, but that doesn't seem to be effective. One does not get good price performance. Then we've also looked at compensated summation where we derive three explicit expressions and we may have a fourth one. And we have first and second order deterministic and probabilistic bounds. And the first order bound differs from the uh, well-known bound by one U, which may be um, nothing, but on the other hand, it's not, uh, it goes a little bit against uh, uh, traditional wisdom. And the first order probabilistic bound is accurate with an effect of 10. So this is accurate, but more expensive. If you want to compromise, there's that fab sum paper by uh, Pierre Blanchard and, and Theo Marie and Nikayem where they, they show you how to do hybrid algorithms to make things uh, still accurate, but um, uh, cheaper. And there's a paper that goes with that. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>